Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's so good to see you this morning. We are so glad that you have joined us for worship today at Oak Ridge Wesleyan Church. My name is Pastor Christia. If I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, I'd love to meet you after service. There's also another way you can connect with us, whether you're a guest or you've been attending for a long time. Um, we have these blue cards that are located in the seat in front of you. They're kind of our connection cards. So if you take them out, you can do any updates and your contact information. You can um, share prayer requests with us. You can request a meeting with us. You can ask questions about what's going on. Maybe you have a deep theological question you want to uh, just really hammer out. You know, things like that. That's what those are for. So go ahead and um, get those out, fill them out, and you can drop them in the plates, um, our offering plates, as you leave after service this morning, or you can hand them directly to us. But we would love to connect with you, love to pray for you this week. Um, hopefully you all received our bulletin with the notes on one side and some announcements on the other this morning. Um, we want to uh, remind our missions committee that we will be meeting tomorrow evening at 6.30 here at the church. We also have our Wednesday night, Wednesday evening programs on there for you. The Florida District Men's Retreat is this w coming weekend, the 10th and the 11th. So if you're interested in signing up, and um, we just signed someone up this morning. So um, if you would like to sign up, we can help you do that. And um, it's going to be a great opportunity to um, connect with God and to connect and um, encourage other men throughout the district in um, your walk with the Lord. Next Sunday, I don't have, oh, I do have the clicker. Um, we have our annual homecoming Sunday, and this is an opportunity to invite someone to our church family, invite someone home. Uh, maybe they're not connected. Maybe they've been connected in the past and haven't been for a while. This is an opportunity to invite them to come. Every Sunday really is an opportunity for that, and we want you to be reaching out and inviting people every week, but this is just going to be a great fellowship Sunday. We're going to have a gospel concert with Highway Harmony, um, with Truck Stop Ministries that will be here. We're also going to have a uh, potluck. Um, the potluck is um, basically bring something, bring a family favorite recipe, or if your week is busy, um, grab something, uh, grab and go. Um, you can bring that too, but it's kind of fun, I think, to share a family favorite recipe or something that's been passed down through your family. There's a little bit more meaning that you're, you have there if you're able no pressure. But we would love for you to join us for that. There is a sign-up sheet out in the fellowship area called, we call it the meet and greet, out there. If you can let us know that you will be attending, that way we know how many plates, how many, you know, beverages, that kind of thing, and what we're expecting food-wise. Um, but we would love for you to join us next Sunday. That'll be at 10 o'clock, and then we'll eat afterwards. So make sure you invite someone to join you. The holiday season is upon us, which is just mind-blowing for me and uh, I don't know about you but I'm already putting uh, dates on the calendar for the next couple of months and so we provided some dates not all of the information um, for them but we provided some dates for you um, we're going to be decking the halls and decorating the church in a few weeks we have campfire Christmas that's going to be coming up on Sunday December 10th we're going to have a women's event called Favorite Things on the 15th. Largo Christmas Parade will be participating in that again this year. That's on Saturday, December 16th. And on Christmas Eve, which is a Sunday this year, we will have two services, the morning worship service with a Christmas cookie potluck, Pastor PJ, P, well, not Pastor PJ, but PJ's favorite event, I think, of the year. He's like Buddy the Elf and loves his cookies. Um, Christmas cookie potluck um, after service that morning, and then we'll come back for a beautiful candlelight Christmas Eve service that day. So I hope that you're excited, and this is just to give you that information. More details are online for a lot of these and start inviting friends and family out to these things and give them the dates to save as well we're looking forward to what god is going to do he's been doing amazing things already excuse me um i need some water apparently um we've been looking forward to just gathering even on this day together and speaking of water isn't this a nifty cup Pastor PK, listen, last week was Pastor Appreciation Sunday, and um, I, Pastor John and I just really wanted to, and I know Pastor Petey as well, we just really felt um, 
the love and b true blessing from you all. We want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We love you guys. We appreciate you as our church family. It's an honor and a, a blessing to be able to um, be a part of this church body and be able to help lead us closer to in having encounters with the Lord and walking closer together with him and, and growing in our faith together. So we want to thank you for that. Apparently, I was okay without the water, but it, because I brought it up, refreshing. All right. So thank you. Thank you so much from the bottom of our heart. I'm going to go ahead and pray as um, I invite you all to stand up as we prepare our hearts for worship through song and as the worship team comes forward. Heavenly Father, you are so good and we just thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather in your name in this place. God, we are so thankful for how you provide for us, for all that you give us, the very breath in our lungs this morning. Maybe we feel a little bit more refreshed this morning with Maybe we feel like we got some extra rest last night with the time change or whatever it is, God. I, I just thank you that we are here and that we have set aside this time to be gathered together to worship you, to be encouraged. Um, God, I don't know where everyone is this morning. Whether they come in dancing and celebrating or they come in tired and, and suffering, but God, you are here. You have been here leading up to this very moment. And so, God, we just ask that as we focus on you, as we seek you, Lord, that we would just sense your presence in a very real and tangible way and that we would draw close to your heart, that we would fix our eyes on you, not anything else in our worship and in our praise, but you, and that we would put you on the rightful throne of our hearts and our lives this morning again that we would give you the control of everything going on in our lives and that we would surrender all of ourselves as an act of worship this morning god we believe that you are doing things here in our in our church and through our people and god i ask for more i ask for the um things that we can't even see the th the unimaginable things to be done in your name for your kingdom's sake and so god i pray that we would hear you clearly today because you're always close you're always with us and God help us to respond to your voice today that calls us out in steps of faith may we grow more in love with you it's in your name I pray amen
Amen. Are you excited this morning to have that opportunity to remember that Jesus is in charge, that we can hail him and crown him as the king of our lives? And as we gather in this place this morning, we can experience the joy that comes from the Lord, remembering who is truly sovereign, who is the ruler, who is the Lord of our lives. If our faith is in Jesus, we remember, God, you're bigger. You're in control. You're in charge. Not all of the things that cause me fear and cause me worry and anxiety, but Jesus Christ is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And today, no matter what is going on in my life, I gather in with my other fellow friends and believers in Jesus and declare there's joy today in the house of the Lord because God still sits on the throne of our lives. Amen. I invite you to continue in worship with us.
again and again is all that I have is a hallelujah hallelujah I know it's not much but nothing else fit for you except for a heart singing presence, your work in our lives. Grateful that as we gather together in this house, we can remember that there is joy here that is available for us because you're here, because you're in charge, because you're in control. You, you have all of these things. And we have nothing really worthy to give the King of Kings today, God. But we gather in this space simply to remember to be reminded of our, your profound love and your grace in our lives, to express before you our gratitude that we are so grateful and all we can do as we gather is just to sing a hallelujah, to say praise the Lord, to say thank you, God, that even when life is not good, even when circumstances don't go the way we want, you are good and you are with your people and you love us and you give us your strength. So God, I just pray for your people today that as we've gathered here in this place, that we would just sense your presence and that we would be prepared for what you desire, Holy Spirit, to speak into each one of our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Congregation, you may go ahead and be seated. How about now? Yes. Now we're better. All right. Hearing my voice is better, so thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> nice compliment. Um, anyhow, <laughs> I have the opportunity this morning to celebrate communion. And we kind of keep leaning into that theme that we've been going through this morning through worship and just remembering the profound love of the Savior. 
remembering that circumstances don't always go easy for us. They don't always go right. We don't always choose right. How good of God that even when we don't get it right, His goodness is so infinitely better, His grace and His power so infinitely stronger in our lives to bring us back into righteousness, right relationship, connection with God, not that we earned, but because He died on a cross and said it's not about what you have or haven't done, what you've thought or haven't thought, said or haven't said. It's about your heart's allegiance. Are you willing to trust in me, the one who died for you, who gave my life in your place so that you and God could have the connection that you were designed for. As we celebrate communion, we remember a God who came tangibly. We're preparing for the Christmas season coming very soon, as, as PK reminded us of. We remember that God came tangibly. We hold elements tangibly in our hand and we take them into our body and remember that as this Jesus literally gave a physical life on the cross, that his body and his blood cleanses us from our impurities, our misdeeds, our mistakes, our failures, our shortcomings. And just as we take elements inside of us, he desires to place within us his presence that you are the temple of God of the New Testament that he is building by his grace in your life. You don't have to be a member here at Oak Ridge in order to take communion. We simply ask that you have a relationship with Jesus. And if you're unsure, it's, it's really simple. You say to Jesus a simple prayer and say, God, I want to follow you. God, I accept that Jesus died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. And I maybe don't have all of the doctrine and all of the theology figured out quite yet, but I desire to follow you and to accept your grace into my life because what I know that I need is forgiveness and the power and presence of God to walk with me. We invite you to take communion. We, we take communion family style, which means you don't have to come in any certain order of, of rows or chairs or pews. You can come whenever you're ready. We ask that you would take the elements back to your seat. Spend a moment of private reflection and prayer as a song plays on the screens and we'll take them together as a, a family in just a moment. Let's pray over our elements. Father God, we thank you today for the grace of Jesus in our life. We know that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess in heaven and on earth that you are Lord. All will hail the name of Jesus Christ. And yet today we have the opportunity to be so aware of who you are and what you've done, to remember and to reflect on your grace in our lives, on how you took the penalty that was rightfully ours upon the cross. You took that upon yourself and died in our place. Help us to feel your grace, to know your love, and to sense the presence of a God whose spirit is within those who trust in the name of Jesus, our Savior. We pray that you would bless these elements today, Lord, this time of reflection as we remember your sacrifice for our sins that we might be made new in Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You may come when you're ready. <coughs>
This is communion. Take it as often as you will. For his blood has power still. By his wounds we shall be healed. This is communion. The night he was betrayed, Jesus gathered together with his disciples in the upper realm. Sharing the Passover meal, he took bread and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Let us take together in remembrance of him. As they shared the meal, he took a cup symbolized the blood of the lamb that once had been placed on the doorposts of homes, signifying that the death angel would pass over them. Jesus gave new meaning to the cup that night. So this now represents a new covenant, a new promise between God and his people. Once again, death would pass over God's people, but it would be the blood of a new lamb, Jesus himself, whose blood was poured out and shed for you, that you would be forgiven and able to enter into God's grace, cleansed, new, and invited into the holiness and the rest that is his presence. Let us take together in remembrance of him. Jesus, we remember today with grateful hearts this meal that we have the opportunity to celebrate as your followers. This table is open to all who will come before you, Jesus, to recognize that you have died for us, that we might receive the gift of life that you desire. Help us not to take it lightly, but to remember today the profound, the powerful love and sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to go ahead and remind you of our tithes and offerings that I almost forgot. 
Uh, we have uh, tithes and offerings available uh, as you exit the sanctuary in either direction this morning. We want to remind you of that opportunity to give. You can also give online at oakridgewc.com slash give. And then we also want to go ahead and dismiss our kids uh, and volunteers who are part of Adventure Kids this morning. How are you doing this morning, Oak Ridge? Good. I was pretty enthusiastic. I like that. I am trying to open things and uh, give me a second. Sorry about that. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I would invite you to get out your Bible and lift it up nice and high and just say, I got my Bible, PJ. We are going to be a couple of different passages we're going to talk about this morning. If you want to turn to James chapter 1 and or John chapter 11, we'll definitely spend a little bit more time in John chapter 11 when we get there. And so I'd invite you to turn there if you'd like to. But I've um, been sharing for a little while some of the stories that have come out of my time of sabbatical. And thank you again for that gift of just being able to be away with the Lord. It was one of the healthiest times in my life spiritually. And I'm just so grateful for some of the soul surgery that God had did in my life during that. And it's been my joy to share with you just some of the stories. There were way too many stories for me to be able to share all of them. Um, but some of you are probably getting tired of stories as well. So so if you're getting tired of the stories, I've got this week and we're going to share one more uh, kind of from that before we kind of move on and you don't have to hear about sabbatical too much anymore. If you're enjoying them, then you really get to enjoy today and one more. So uh, either way, uh, hopefully you can feel a little bit happy about that. But I've been sharing just some of those lessons that God had been sharing with me. And one of those profound lessons that I shared with you was just the, the message from the Holy Spirit to slow down in life. Our culture, particularly in the United States of America, thrives on being busy. It's almost a status symbol. If you talk to somebody and you don't say, I'm busy, you almost feel guilty for it. And yet Jesus invites us into rest. He says, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The creation story has rest built into it. All of the Old Testament celebrations and festivals are periods of rest. Our God likes rest. Can I get an amen from the church? Amen. It is a godly thing to enter rest. And Jesus was reminding me that sometimes in life I go at a frenetic pace and he's simply asking me, slow down and walk with me. He was reminding me um, of his strength. I talked about the Ice Lake Trail and just this beautiful trail, this beautiful lake high up in the mountains. But all throughout the trail, God was reminding me of his strength that is with me. And he'd been working in the weeks prior to that hike, reminding me to lay down the weights that I sometimes carry on my soul and on my heart and I never bring before the Lord. And he was saying, you need to lay down the things that are keeping you from me and walk in my strength and in my presence. Last week I shared about one of my uh, greatest bucket lists before the trip and going on the trip that I got to go to Grand Canyon and I got to hike a 14 or a 14,000 foot mountain. And in both of these experiences, God was just showering me with his unique love. And God sees you, not just the whole world, but he knows exactly how he's made you. And he loves and desires you. 
So this week I want to share another story with you and maybe focus, uh, try to focus a little bit more on what I felt like God was teaching me through this whole experience. But I left Quandry Peak and I spent kind of a day just basically taking it easy and kind of transitioning a little bit. My goal was to get to Rocky Mountain National Park a couple of days later. And so I eventually drove up a, another little mountain road to a, a place in a national forest. These immature bighorn sheep loved something in the road. I have no idea what it was, but they were there for like an hour trying to eat the road. Um, I made my camp, and I was able to set up this kind of office space. I've got my book and my journal, another Panera Bread drink there, and I just sat for a while um, drinking in the beauty of creation with nobody around but this beautiful mountain view and able to spend some time with the Lord. I didn't really have plans for what was going to come the day after this, other than I wanted to go to Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, Rocky Mountain National Park is actually where Christia and I spent our honeymoon, and 19 years before this, I had been there, and I'd always wanted to have the opportunity uh, to go back and to experience it again. The night that I was in that particular campground was an odd night for me. I sometimes have these weird nights of just anxiety and different things, and it was kind of one of those sleepless nights. I had some things that were on my brain, silly things. I knew that there were bears in the area where I was, and I kept having this image of a bear like pushing on the van and trying to get in. And it was, it was silly now, but it was one of those things. You ever have those silly things that just keep you up at night? And, and I didn't sleep very well at all. And I remember I kept checking like my watch and my phone, like thinking, what time is it? I'm like an hour away from Rocky Mountain National Park. And I kind of, I made this like deal with God and myself. I was like, I have to at least like stay laid down with my eyes closed until four. It was like Christmas morning. You ever tell your kids, you can't get up until whatever time it is. Like that was kind of my deal with God was all right, at 4 a.m. I can start getting up. And so sure enough, I kept checking the watch all night long, and 4 a.m. finally came. I still really hadn't slept at all, but I decided I'm getting up, got the pack ready, made my lunch, got everything uh, ready for the day, brought some coffee and my journal back out to that office space there and just kind of spent some time until first light. And eventually I headed up to Rocky Mountain National Park. I got there, and it was interesting as I got to Rocky Mountain National Park, even just driving into Estes Park, immediately the memories started to flood my mind. I could remember where I had been, and I remembered being there with Christia, and I'm weeks into this trip away from Christia and spending time with the Lord that had been amazing, but I was really starting to miss being with my best friend who I spend a majority of most of my days with, and now I've been without her for for weeks, and my heart was kind of aching. Also, I'll spare you some of the details, but I had some issues that morning. I wasn't throwing up or anything, but I had some digestive things going on, and they were causing me some severe pain. I made my way into the park, and one of my desires was to go back to an area that Christia and I really liked on our honeymoon. Um, There's a hike called Bear Lake and Alberta Falls, and I really wanted to see those again. But the way that the park was set up, I wasn't able to get in um, unless I paid more money and I hadn't pre-registered. And so it was kind of, I went there, I tried to get in early, and it wasn't going to work out. I had to come back at 6 p.m. that evening if I wanted to get into that area. So that was kind of roughly my plan. Throughout the day, and pretty much throughout my trip, God had allowed me to see these sunflowers everywhere. We don't have them too often in Florida, but they're Christia's favorite flower, and it was kind of just beautiful that morning as I was driving into this place, remembering her and thinking about her, that there they were once again. The views in Rocky Mountain National Park were absolutely stunning. My heart was in kind of an odd place, though. I was tired. I'd already hiked uh, Ice Lake Trail and and Quandry Peak earlier that week, just a couple of days before this, and I kind of decided that I was just going to take my time in Rocky Mountain National Park. I wasn't in any particular hurry, didn't have any real desires. I was just kind of going to drive Trail Ridge Road, which is the highest highway in the United States, and I was just going to kind of enjoy some of the pull-offs and some of the views. Eventually made my way all the way up to the Alpine Visitor Center, a little little under 12,000 feet. It's the highest uh, visitor center in the national park system. 
And it was a fun experience there. It was the first time in my life I've ever been sleeted on in August. Um, but I got sleeted on while I was at the Alpine Visitor Center. And then I decided I was going to have a gourmet lunch with a beautiful view. Uh, so I hiked up to the 12,000 feet that you can go to right there and had my peanut butter and jelly with the view. wasn't quite sure what to do with the day. I'd made it up to the Alpine Visitor Center. It was still kind of early mid-morning. It had started kind of weird, and I decided I was just going to drive slowly back towards Bear Lake that I couldn't quite get into yet and see what happened. You can kind of see some clouds in this picture, and if you remember, I told you last week, it was going to start raining in Colorado as the week went on, so I was kind of watching the clouds in the morning, a little bit uncertain of what they were going to do. I went down from here a little bit to a trail that I started walking on, and it was beginning to sprinkle, and I had my trekking poles with me, and by this time in the trip, I loved my trekking poles and some of the equipment. They had kept me on a massive 14,000-foot hike, and I was hiking along a rather flat area, but with some slippery rocks, and I lost my balance and threw down my trekking pole really hard, and I bent my trekking pole. And I was sitting there, and I'm so I'm glad that I didn't like fall and break my leg on the side of a mountain. But at the same time, I was kind of just upset about my trekking pole. I made a couple other short hikes as I made my way back down the valley, and I eventually ended up in this little valley creek area. All day, I'd kind of had trouble understanding, like, what is this day supposed to be about? What am I supposed to get? And I'd kind of been looking for some of the epic views, but honestly, the highest I got in Rocky Mountain was 12,000. I'd already been at Quandary at 14, so it just kind of felt, yeah, I've already done a bigger thing than this, and I don't really know what to get out of it. This valley was a moment where God was kind of reminding me again of some of what I'd learned early on in the trip, all the way back at that Arkansas Sphinx, to slow down and be on pace with him. And in this valley that was very underwhelming little stream, I began to just breathe in God's presence and be reminded, you are here. And I enjoyed my valley hike probably better than any of my epic mountain views up until that point. If I'm honest, I was kind of agitated this day. Things just weren't quite adding up. I hadn't slept right. I was in pain. I was really missing Christia. Uh, the, the, I'd bent my trekking pole. Christia was doubly on my mind because this is a, a place where uh, we had spent significant time in before. And then I'm thinking about everything that she's going through back home. She, she's leading the church by herself. She's leading the house by herself. And she has a full-time job. And I just wasn't able to really get into the experience. I thought from here I would drive a little bit closer to Bear Lake, but I was already close and it was several hours until I could get in there. So I parked at the bottom of a mountain that's called Deer Mountain. Saw the trailhead sign that said it's a three-mile hike up to Deer Mountain, and I said to myself and God, I have no interest in hiking a mountain. <laughs> I am exhausted. I have already done uh, like eight-mile mountain hikes a couple of times this week. I'm tired. I'm worn out. No, ain't happening. So I left everything in the van. Didn't bring a jacket, didn't bring uh, my, my pack, didn't bring food, didn't bring water, didn't bring trekking poles. I just said, I'm not interested in hiking a mountain, God, but let's just talk. Let's just kind of hang out. I've got time to kill, so I'm just kind of going to walk around on the bottom of the mountain. I could see some rain clouds on the horizon, and I wasn't quite sure when or if the rain was going to hit, but the views were pretty, and so I decided just to walk and to spend some time praying. And as I walked, I began to connect with the Lord, and I began to think about some of the things that were on my heart. Some of the little agitations of that day, my big concern for Christia and really wanting to do what I could, which was nothing from Colorado, to alleviate the suffering she was going through and the, the issues that she was dealing with. And I was thinking about some of the things that I carried throughout my life. And I began to kind of just wonder really heavily, like, God, why do I feel this way 
today? Why do people go through the kinds of things that they go through? Why is things so difficult in life sometimes? I was on Deer Mountain, and a lot of my prayer was focused on my dear wife. It was kind of a play on words. But I was also really just wrestling with, God, if it was me, I know how you've wired me. Like, I'm a peacemaker. My desire is to make things better for everybody. And I will just always lay down and sacrifice and do everything I can. And sometimes I end up unhealthy because I'm sacrificing my own health to help others. And God, why don't you, you're God, you're sovereign, you have all the strength in the world. How come you don't just make things better? And I very clearly felt the Holy Spirit say these words back to me. Sometimes I use suffering to grow my people. Sometimes I let things happen in life. Sometimes my people go through things and I don't immediately fix it because I'm using suffering to grow my people. It kind of knocked me over as I was hiking that morning or that afternoon. It wasn't the answer I wanted. <laughs> I wanted some of the answers from previous hikes about strength and about love and those things I liked. And now I'm complaining about suffering and trying to give my burdens to Jesus. And he says, sometimes I use suffering to grow my people. And I went, wait, what? I kept hiking and processing this thought a little bit. And eventually I looked at my trail map. The trail to Deer Mountain comparative to Quandry Peak and Ice Lake was a really easy trail. It was about 10,000 feet in elevation, and it was a longer uh, trail. It was about three miles up and back, um, but it was much, much easier. And so eventually, I pulled out my trail app, and I looked at where I was, and I realized I am much closer to the summit than I am to the trailhead. I've been hiking for the last hour and a half to two hours and just praying and pouring my heart out with Jesus and wrestling with this phrase, and I realized I'm close enough. I might as well just finish this mountain <laughs> So there were some times where I was hiking where it wasn't too difficult, but I was like, okay, when does this end? And I kept pulling out the trail app like, I'm going to be there already. I'm not going to turn back. Eventually, though, I did. I made it to the summit of Deer Mountain, which has a really pretty overview of Estes Park and Rocky Mountain National Park. And the funny thing was, I didn't want to hike this mountain. <laughs> I had no intentions that day of hiking Deer Mountain. It just kind of happened by accident. And God was reminding me how even that mountain and some of my others are a lot like suffering in our life. Sometimes we don't feel prepared for it. We're just going out for a walk. We're just enjoying the views, enjoying life, and we just kind of think we're out for some time with Jesus, and all of a sudden we find ourselves in the middle of a situation and go, why am I here? I didn't intend to be here. Why am I in this spot? Sometimes we see clouds on the horizon, but we're just not quite sure. Is that going to go around me? Is that going to break up? Is that going to hit me? What, what do I need to do if that comes? Worry and are unsure. Sometimes in life we just feel tired. We've been through stuff in the past, and we're looking at the next thing and going, I am just far too tired. I don't think I can handle another mountain in my life. Sometimes we're on the journey so long that we keep looking for the answer, like, when does this end? When, can we get to, to, to chapter 21 and 22, that come Lord Jesus? That sounds good about now. Sometimes God allows suffering into our lives because it's something he wants to use to grow us. Jesus' half-brother James says it this way, probably not too many people's favorite verse. He says, Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. And God was speaking into my life the, the truth of these words from, from James chapter 1 saying, there are things that I want to do in your life, John. 
There are things in, in, in your wife's life that I want to do. And, and there are things in the people in your church's life that I want to do. And here's the thing. You can't take that away. You can't put all of that upon yourself. You can't alleviate everybody else's suffering because sometimes I'm going to use suffering to grow my people. Sometimes I need to do something in their life and you have to allow them to hurt. Sometimes in your own life, you need to allow your own self space to hurt, to go through things. Because as you walk through those situations, I'm growing you. I'm strengthening your faith. I'm producing something within you that your faith might be a more mature faith. That you might be complete the way that I want you to be. I begin to realize on the summit of my mountain that it's not only about God's strength and his love, but those things come into his, his desire to use suffering in my life. And if God is going to complete what he wants to complete and wants to accomplish in growing my faith, I have to learn to suffer, to persevere, to grow resilience. Both Christy and I read a book called Resilient on our sabbatical that was a very powerful book to read. Only then... Is our faith mature and complete? God, I believe, was also speaking another truth to me on that mountain, saying that no one hurts more than me when my children suffer. I don't delight in the suffering of my children. It was never my design in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. I didn't design and create suffering. Sin brought suffering into the world. But because it is here, it is not loving for God simply to take it away. Just like in your kid's life, if every time they experience suffering and pain, you try to take it away, they never grow. They never develop. They never become strong and resilient and ready to face the world that one day you have to send them out into. It's not loving as a parent to always immediately remove the suffering from your kid's life. Otherwise, they never get strong enough to face life. God was reminding me, but just like a good parent, I hurt when my kids hurt. I chose on my mountain to submit myself to God's discipleship. Even if it meant that in my life and in the lives of people around me, I was going to have to endure some suffering. I mean, the truth of the matter is, the guy that we follow, the central imagery of the Christian faith, is a Roman torture device. If the God that we follow went through that, if that's the central imagery of our faith, don't we think that it might involve more than just gumdrops and roses and mountain goats and sunflowers? It might involve some suffering as well. The rain clouds were definitely moving closer to the mountain as I was on it. And I wasn't quite sure how long they were going to last or when they were going to hit, but I knew I needed to get off the mountain. And so I started to go down the mountain, and I did something I haven't done in years. Now, to some of you, I look really young and really healthy, but the truth of the matter is my knees have been shot for years. And so running just isn't really an option for me. But a weird thing happened on Deer Mountain where I had finally surrendered to God's plan to use suffering in my life and to trust that he was good even in the middle of my situations that weren't always good. And I just felt this freedom on the mountain saying, God, I'm willing to give that to you because I know that even in the middle of suffering, your strength and your love go with me. And so I will walk through what you give me and on the way down the mountain, I ran down the mountain, smiling ear to ear on the mountain that we just prayed about suffering for hours. And it was a beautiful, 
jog. I cannot tell you what it felt like, how freeing and just alive I felt running down the mountain. I smiled at people. I had the best spiritual conversations that I had with like random strangers anywhere on my trip coming down from Deer Mountain. Some people had not been on 14ers earlier in the week and they were still coming up. They didn't really like the guy who was running down with a big smile on his face, um, but I still had a really just great time running down. By God's grace, if this was the door to the minivan, I made it to about right here, and it started to downpour. So I made those last three steps to the van door, got in the van, and it just, the skies opened up buckets down upon the van. I pulled out the weather app and looked at the radar, and it was going to downpour the rest of the evening. So Bear Lake and Alberta Falls were going to remain as something that was special only for Christia and my time in Rocky Mountain National Park. But I'd learned what I felt like God had brought me there for that day. One of the ways, I think, in life that you sometimes know that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you is he says the same things again and again. <laughs> You ever had that experience? Like you feel like God says something to you and you're like, eh, I don't know if I like that. And you keep going with life and then all of a sudden there it is again and you're like, eh, I'm not sure if I like it. And then there it is again and again. Sometimes God will repeat himself as a way of trying to get our attention and teach us a lesson. So I left Colorado a couple of days after Rocky Mountain National Park and I started heading back east. I was driving through Kansas, and I wanted to go to a church, and so I looked up a church and discovered that I was going to go to Grace Point Church in Topeka, Kansas. I showed up there. It was a Wesleyan church, and I was excited. They had a worship night that evening, so I was kind of going to spend my day in Topeka. I showed up that morning, and the sermon series, as I looked at it, was, How Do People Grow? And the topic of the day? Suffering. The phrase God told me on Deer Mountain was, sometimes I use suffering to grow my people. And now I sit down at a church whose sermon series is, how do people grow? Through suffering. I'm not going to preach Pastor Tim's message in its entirety, but he worked through a story that for many of us who've been around church for a while, we've heard the story before. And I want to share a little bit of what this story was and Though Tim didn't use points, these are kind of the points that I was gaining as he talked and shared through this story this morning. Some of the lessons that correlated with what Jesus was teaching me on the mountain and some of the things that I think he may want to share with some of us about suffering this morning. That's a very familiar story about Lazarus and his sisters. And the temptation, if we know the story, is to know the ending of the story and to allow our hearts to jump there. And even as Pastor Tim said, I would encourage you to slow down for a minute. Listen to the story where the characters in the story are. Feel what they're feeling in the moment as they feel it before you allow your brain to jump to where the story's going. So John chapter 11 opens this way. It says, A man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent word to Jesus saying, Lord, the one you love is sick. The really interesting thing about this verse is that sometimes God allows suffering in the life of someone he loves. See, Lazarus is known to Jesus. Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they're friends of Jesus. He's stayed in their home before. He's taught in their home before. And when Lazarus is sick, the message that Mary and Martha send to Jesus is not, hey, Jesus, we want to let you know that Lazarus of Bethany at 555 Main Street is sick. Please show up. They say, the one you love is sick knowing that immediately Jesus would be aware of who they're talking about. Because he has a relationship, he has a connection, and his heart deeply loves Lazarus. They have a friendship and a connection. 
God sometimes allows suffering in the life of someone he loves or to kind of flip the way you say it, just because you're suffering doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. Doesn't mean that Jesus has forgotten about you because he still uniquely loves you. Jesus knows who you are. And when somebody sends up the prayer, all they would have to say is, Jesus, the one you love is going through. And he would know you. And he would know what it is that you're walking through and what you are right in the middle of. The story continues in verse 4, saying, when he, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus tells those who are with him that sometimes God allows suffering for Jesus' glory. We all like glory in, in life, but we like the kind of glory that's like, I won the Stanley Cup! Yes! Or I got the promotion at work and now I'm getting the bigger salary and there are people who are underneath me. Or I drove to, to Walmart and I got the parking spot at the front! We like that kind of glory. But God sometimes wants to leverage our suffering for his glory. You ever think of anybody you know who has rock-solid faith? That person that you'd look at and you'd be like, they and Jesus are like this. I think of our late friend David Duncan. I think of his faith and you can just see him and you're like, man, loves Jesus. Jesus just loves him. You think of somebody who has that kind of faith and they've been through stuff. There's situations in their life that they have walked through with God that has grown them, that has allowed them to be resilient, to persevere, to have that mature and complete faith. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God wants to use the suffering, the pain, the, the hurt, the situations in life that we go through, the mountains we didn't intend to walk on for Jesus' glory. And one of the hardest things I think about Jesus in the midst of our suffering is that he's not always in the same hurry that we're in. The next verse says this. It says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he packed up everything and immediately went back to them. It says, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. I mean, in the middle of our suffering, in the middle of our pain, in the middle of our situation, don't we feel like that? Like, where are you? What is taking so long? And Jesus just isn't in the hurry that we're in. He's not moving on our timetable. In this story, he does not immediately jump into action to stop the suffering, even though he probably could have. He loves this family, Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And yet his action is slow and not immediate. And then once he makes the decision to go, listen to his disciples. His disciples say, but Rabbi, a short while ago when we were there, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Essentially, they're saying, you want us to go back? And after he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I'm going there to wake him up. And his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Right? It's kind of common. He's sick. Let him sleep. We don't have to go back there. It's dangerous. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And then he says something crazy. He says, for your sake, I am glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. 
But let us now go to him. Jesus tells them we're going back. And then he says, we waited for two days and he's dead now. And for your sake, I'm glad we didn't go before. I'm glad he died for your sake. Sometimes God allows suffering for someone else's faith. This is crazy to think about, but sometimes the person that Jesus is discipling in their faith is not even the person going through the suffering themselves. Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they're the ones suffering. They're the ones whose brother has just died. They're the guy who has died and has been placed in the tomb. And Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, for your sake, I'm glad that it happened the way that it happened. Because I'm trying to grow your faith as my disciples who are watching somebody else go through suffering. There might be something in your life that you're going through. And sometimes we wonder, like, God, I think I've got the lessons. I've hiked the other mountains. Aren't I good by now? What is it you still want to teach me? Maybe Jesus has other followers who are watching your life. And he's saying, I have things I want to teach them as they watch what I'm doing with you. And so I'm using your situation to grow my people. And your suffering is producing faith in somebody else's life. Jesus eventually makes it to Bethany, and we're told this part of the story, starting at verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, like a good Jewish girl who knew her theology, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus says something to her that is strange. Something you only say if you're a complete liar, you're completely crazy. Or maybe just maybe it's actually true. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Martha, do you believe that? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah. You're the Son of God who is to come into the world. Jesus wants to use our suffering to bring us to him. When Jesus finally shows up on the scene, it almost reads like Mary is just too overcome with grief at this moment. She doesn't come out right away, but but Martha goes to see Jesus, and she brings him her pain, and Jesus kind of meets both of these sisters where they're at. And Martha, if you remember her other story, when Jesus was in their home, Martha was busy getting dinner ready, cleaning the house, making sure that everything was done and perfect for their dinner guests. Because Martha is a doer. She's concerned with what is getting done. And in this moment, her brother has died, and she goes to Jesus, and she's angry. If you had been here, you could have done something about this. You could have kept this from happening. And yet I know that now, even now, the Father will do whatever you ask. She's concerned with what Could Jesus have done? What will Jesus do? And Jesus responds to her saying, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Your situation and what you wanted me to do and what you want me to do are less important than that you know who I am. I need you to know 
that whether I was here four days ago or no matter what I do now in this instant, for your faith, it is not about what I did or what I do. It is about who I am. I am resurrection and life. Are you willing to trust? Are you willing to believe in me whether the situation looks the way you want? The thing that is important for you, Martha, is not the situation. It's me. Are you willing to see me for who I am in the middle of your situation regardless of what happens? Jesus is far more interested in our ability to see him than he is in changing our situation. We're told in the story that a large number of people had come from Jerusalem to visit this grieving family. In fact, in Jewish custom, grieving was a very um, important part of the process. They would even hire professional grievers to help you grieve. Mary eventually comes to see Jesus. And Mary has the same accusation. If you read the passage, it's the same words. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But if you remember again, Mary, earlier in their story, when Jesus came to teach at their home and Martha was doing everything, where was Mary? At the feet of Jesus, listening wanting to be in the presence of her Savior. And so the way I read their accusation, their words are the same, but Martha is concerned. Jesus, I wanted you to do something. And Mary says, if you had been here, if you had been here, you felt absent. I love to sit at your feet. I love to be with you. This situation could have been different. Where were you? I needed you in this situation. I need you. And Jesus does something very profound. As Mary is overcome with grief and everybody who is with her is grieving, we are gifted the shortest verse in Scripture. And in John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus just weeps with Mary. He sees her pain. And this is the person that he loves, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, the family that he loves. And Jesus weeps. Because when we suffer, Jesus suffers with us. When we go through pain, Jesus is not in heaven trying to cause it like, <laughs> he suffers with us. When you cry, he cries. When you hurt, he hurts. And Jesus tenderly engages Mary right in the midst of her pain and loss because it is a pain that he bears as well. And many of us are familiar with the next part of the story that Jesus and the sisters go out to the tomb and Jesus calls forth Lazarus to walk out of the grave and he walks out still wearing grave clothes and Jesus tells the crowd to take the grave clothes off of Lazarus. And the story concludes in verse 45 with these words. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and who had seen what Jesus did believed in him. Your testimony might be the thing that causes somebody else to believe in Jesus. All of these Jews had come because they saw the grief, they saw the pain, and they were watching this family go through the hurt, go through the heartache, walk the mountain that they didn't intend to have to walk through in this moment. And Jesus leverages their situation. He is present in the midst of their situation. They acknowledge that he is resurrection and life, that he is suffering with them. They draw their lives to him. And their testimony becomes the thing that others who have gathered around to watch begin to say, yes, this Jesus that you follow, he is the Messiah. It just might be that in your story, you're suffering, hurting, waiting for Jesus to answer you and wondering why he doesn't seem to be doing what you want him to do. Why does he feel so absent? And yet there are people watching. 
people who don't even know the Lord. And they're wondering about you. Is that faith real? Does Jesus show up and do anything? Is he present in the middle of your suffering? And it just may be your testimony that causes somebody else to believe in Jesus. And this can be true regardless of what he does in your situation, whether he does what you want or not. Several years ago, I got word that my paternal grandfather was very sick, and we knew that it was terminal. We call him Papa. He's a teddy bear of a man, and everybody in our family loved Papa. He just embodied grace and compassion and warmth and love for his family. He's my namesake, John William Wickstrom Sr. When he passed away, it was a tough funeral for some of our family members. How are we going to continue on without this warm, compassionate, teddy bear, glue-like member of the family? Some of our family really wrestled with Papa's loss. My father and I, the other John William Wickstroms, got to get up and speak and share about this man who didn't just give us his name, but his faith. And to share about how Papa had lived his life loving Jesus and that the tenderness and the compassion and the grace that everybody was so aware of in his life was because of his profound love for Jesus. What Jesus had done in his life and his desire throughout his whole life was to show and reflect the love of God to his family. And so that tenderness and that warmth and that compassion that they felt was the love of Jesus at work in him. We loved being able to share, and it was a great ceremony to honor Papa. And I'll never forget, a couple months later, I was sitting on my couch at our home in Chicago at the time, and I got a message from one of my family members who said, before Papa passed, God had been working a little bit in my heart. But there were things that you said that day at the funeral that God was really stirring in my life. And God has been continuing to speak. And I want to let you know that I have given my life to Jesus. And I'm getting ready to be baptized at my church with some other members of our family this weekend. And I just wanted to thank you for sharing the testimony of Papa's life. Your testimony just might be the thing. Even if it doesn't go the way you want, that causes somebody else to believe in Jesus. Jesus is not looking to cause you pain out of cruelty. He loves you. And when you hurt, he hurts with you. And like a good father who holds their child when they skin their knee after they've fallen off of their bike, Jesus wants to weep with you and hold you in his arms and carry you through the midst of those difficult and painful situations. But he knows that suffering is a path to growth. There are things he cannot accomplish in your faith or even the lives of those who are watching you unless you go through suffering. And like a muscle that has to be torn in order to grow back stronger, sometimes he will allow you to endure certain things in life in order to grow you. In the middle of it, he not only invites us to have faith in what he might do to fix the situation, but to cling to who he is as a God who is sovereign over our suffering, that he is resurrection and life, that he is making all things new, that suffering that exists in our world as a result of the fall will not have the final word. He will. The difference for so many people, Pastor Tim shared, and I think this is true. He said, if we think pain and suffering is the end of our story, we will crumble. For so many people, as they face the mountains of life that they didn't intend to, that they weren't prepared for, that they were too tired to get to, sometimes we see that this is the end. This is all there is. And if we think that what we're going through is all there is, we often crumble and give up our faith. We lose faith in our ability to follow him. But if we are able to see what we're going through as only part of our story, we are able to see it, as James said, 
joy producing something in us. Think of every good story you've ever heard, every good book you've ever read, every biography you've ever learned, every movie you've ever watched. There's three basic elements to any good story. There's characters who exist in some time or place, a setting. They endure some hardship, some conflict, a mountain they didn't intend, something happens in their life. And sometimes it looks really dark until the hero of the story is able to bring some kind of resolution at the end of it. You'll go through stuff in life. You're going to suffer. It's going to be painful and it's going to hurt. And it's just a reality of life. But it's not the end of your story. There's an epic hero in your story who looks at the middle of the suffering, who's walking with it. And as you're on this mountain, reminds you of the mountains you've already walked and says, my strength can still be with you. My love is still walking with you. And this is not where your story ends. I am producing something in you and in those around you. And this is the path that I have chosen in my sovereignty to use if you will allow me to redeem your story. He asks us essentially the same question he asked Martha. I'm right here. I'm in the middle of everything that you're going through. I see you and I love you and I'm here. And whatever you are going through right now is not the end of your story because of who I am and I desire to be. I want to save you even from death itself because I am resurrection and life. Are you willing to believe who I am in the middle of your situation? trust me. Let me pray for you this morning. God, suffering is never an easy topic for us to think about or wrestle with or deal with, and yet it is a reality of our lives that we go through it. And so thank you, God, that you are able to redeem suffering. Just as Jesus came for our redemption and suffered greatly upon the cross on our behalf, we're going to go through things, but it is not the end. Good Friday is not where the story ends. But on the third day, Jesus walked out of the tomb. There is life and there is resurrection. And Jesus, it's not just something he did. It's who he is. And as we go through the pains and the hurts and the sufferings of this life, Thank you that we have in you a Savior who understands, who himself has been through suffering, who weeps with us, who hurts with us. But thank you that there's a future, that the story doesn't end here. And even if the story, worldly speaking, ends in death, it's still not over. Because for those who hope and trust in you, there is a resurrection that yet awaits. Because our Jesus, he is life. He is resurrection. God, I can't know what everybody here is wrestling with today. But the invitation that you give us is to surrender our burdens to you. To bring them before you and to say, God, I know that you could take it away in a minute. If you wanted, you could snap your fingers and it would be gone. But if this is my story, if this is where you have me and where you're calling me to walk, may it produce something in me to strengthen my faith. May you use it in the lives of your other followers who are watching me. May their faith grow. 
And may people who don't even know you, Jesus, may they see me and may they be drawn to you. May you be glorified. God, I choose to believe that even in the middle of my suffering, you are good, you are there, you are strong, and you see me, you walk with me, and you couldn't love me more in the middle of my hurt. So I will surrender to you and I will trust you to use my life, my story, and my situation to bring glory to the King of Kings, the sovereign over all creation, the one who is the resurrection and the life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. We want to remind you again, you have the opportunity to give and worship this morning your tithes and your offerings. Uh, there are baskets available as you exit the sanctuary. It is an important part of our worship. And love to pray over our offering this morning. Jesus, we thank you again for your provision in our lives. We thank you for the goodness that you provide and how you take care of us and our families. As we give back today, we recognize it as an act of worship that everything we have belongs to you. But we give back a portion, Lord, asking that you would bless it for the furthering of your kingdom. And God, as the pastor of this church, I pray that you would bless not only what is given, but those who give today. In Jesus' name, amen. Love to invite you back next week. It is Homecoming Sunday. Bring a dish to pass. Invite somebody to join with you. Have a great week. Go with God and God bless.